Hey, good afternoon. Thanks for tuning in today um, to our Facebook Live uh, devotion, um, our evening Vespers devotion today on um, June 5th, uh, 2020. Uh, we are concluding our time in Acts chapter 2. Uh, this is um, the last of our devotions based upon uh, Pentecost. Uh, we're living in that week of Pentecost, and um, because of that, we uh, we took a deep dive in what an Acts 2 church looks like. Um, if you want to see some of those, they are archived on Facebook and also on YouTube Live at our Maples Church Live YouTube channel. Um, last night's was split into two groups, but Sam has merged the two to put them on YouTube Live if you want to watch them all as one continuum. Uh, we've talked several nights about what that Acts chapter 2 church looks like, the first church, kind of the blueprint for the way maybe we should uh, be building ourselves as a church um, and what the definition of a church really is. Um, it is a collection of God's people doing God's will, making the kingdom manifest around them by being kingdom people. And that's the best definition I can give you for it. And so tonight I wanted to pick up something that we'd kind of skipped over and I wanted to spend my last night with you on it, on this. It is from Acts chapter 2 and it's called Peter's Sermon. It is the sermon Peter delivers this day to the Jews. Now remember, this is a feast and the Jews are gathered from all of the diaspora, uh, from all the vast corners of the empire, uh, the Roman Empire, and they are here Ostensibly for the feast. And yet, we know that they were really here, and God's intention was for them to hear and uh, to birth this new thing the fall of the Holy Spirit and the birth of the church. But we can't read this without reading what Peter said to them. So, here are the words from chapter 2 of Acts and verse 14 uh, from Peter's sermon. But Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, Men of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day. And this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. And it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth of my spirit on all mankind. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall see dreams. Even on my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth of my spirit. And they shall prophesy. And I will grant wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. And that shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst. Just as you yourselves know, this man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. For David says of him, I saw the Lord always in my presence. For he is at my right hand, so that I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue exalted, Moreover, my flesh also will live in hope, because you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You have made known to me the ways of life, and you will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brethren, I may confidently say to you, regarding the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. And so, because he was a prophet, and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on his throne, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades nor did his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus God raised up again, 
to which we are all witnesses. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Holy Spirit the pro from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. There's a lot in this, and there's a ton of our foundational doctrine and theology as Christians, orthodox Christian doctrine that we share with other Christians over 1,000, 2,000 years together in the faith. And it is largely, um, I would argue, founded in these early words of the early church and the interpretations by the great saints, uh, the great scholars, uh, the early church fathers, the desert fathers, and others like them. So what do we take from this passage? Um, it, we could spend days, weeks, months even, uh, by dissecting it piece by piece. But there are a few pieces that I want to highlight. The first is that there was word spread that these men were drunk because they were acting and speaking in languages not their own and they were acting odd. And Peter is, is saying to them, it is but the third hour of the morning which is the third hour since sunrise, which would have been in the 9 or 10 o'clock range. Um, it would have been early morning, and he was saying, these guys ain't drunk, it's early, it's in the morning. But hear the words of the prophet Joel. You see, Peter is quoting scripture, Old Testament scripture, to lay a foundation and to recast the words of the prophet Joel, to reinterpret them in light of Jesus, and to offer an insight into what this new kingdom of God looks like, what the real kingdom of God looks like, and what the plan of God for his kingdom really is. And it shall be in the last days. It says that in verse 17. And it shall be in the last days. Let us be clear. This is not a prophecy of what is yet to come that Peter is talking about. This is not Peter discussing an end-time prophecy Peter is discussing a prophecy of what will happen here and now and what has yet happened. He is citing Joel as proof that we are in the last days. Then, 40 some odd days past the resurrection, past the ascension, it is in this season, in this time, that Peter is referring to the prophet Joel and saying, in the last days, and he's fixing to tell you what happened, and you're going to line up what happened with Jesus and what he did as proof that he is the one from whom Joel speaks. So what does that say to us? It says to us that you and I are in the last days. 2,000 years of the last days? Yeah. Because what happened at this moment is all of human history is marked by a demarcator, and that is Jesus. There is what happened before and what happened after. I've often referred to uh, being in the church age, that we are uh, in a church age people. Um, there's a lot of different mindsets about the end of days. And, you know, a lot of people look around today and are, are terrified or frightened or anxious about all the things that we're undergoing, but um, and, and you hear people online and people prophesy saying, we are in the last days. And my answer is yes, but not in the way you think. Um, if we are thinking that today is a whole lot worse than it was, then we've not looked at our history real well. Uh, we hear about it more because we have better communication. Um, but the great trials and travails, the great anxiousness, the angst, the, the suffering and the pain, um, all of the great things that we look at, there have been plagues before. The plague, the Black Death, that nearly wiped out Western civilization in Europe. Nearly wiped out Western civilization in Europe. There have been other plagues throughout other lands uh, that have nearly completely wiped and have wiped whole civilizations off the map. There have been 
signs and wonders in the sky. There have been um, death at large numbers, wars and rumors of war. Um, we have yet to see a war as great as World War II uh, in its scope and its breadth, except perhaps World War I. World War I was never called World War I until afterwards. It was referred to as the war to end all wars or the Great War. Then World War II was referred to as the war after that. We look to the end of times and say there will be wars and rumors of wars, yet there have been wars and rumors of wars since this day. Western civilization faced down uh, near certain defeat at the hands of Mongol invaders from the steppes. They faced down the, the press by um, the, the tribal folks of Northern Europe that collapsed the Roman Empire or helped collapse it. Um, and the Western civilization, Holy Roman Empire, or whatever it was called, uh, whether you believe that that's what it was or not, but that civilization faced near extinction at the hands of Muslim invaders that pressed all the way in nearly to Paris. Western culture, uh, Christian culture, was hard pressed. And everywhere the church has expanded, it has been oppressed. I don't think we even begin to understand the level of oppression uh, that the church faces on a regular basis and has for hundreds of years and thousands of years in places like um, Iran, Iraq, uh, who are two very different countries. Uh, they're right next to each other, but Iran harkens back to the Persian Empire and Iraq uh, much more um, to uh, Arabic origin. Um, we do not have an understanding of what the suffering of the Christian missionaries were when they went to China. The Baptists have the Lottie Moon Fund and they celebrate you know, her missionary work in China. Uh, but Scottish and other English missionaries uh, suffered great uh, hard press and uh, death even, even up into this century. <laughs> Even up until today, the Christian church in, in China is still oppressed, even to today, and suppressed. All of the things that we see around us, all of the turmoil, um, all of the disasters, we think this is marks of the end time, but it is, it is, but it is, it is where we have been for 2,000 years. And some might argue that there is less poverty, less pain, less suffering, less death. Uh, as a child, you're more apt to live today than you were 100 years ago, and particularly even 1,000 years ago. Life expectancies are longer. Um, there are, we are able to do things that we have not always been able to do, um, explore thought and science and reason. The end times that he's speaking of here that Peter's talking about is at his time. Then he says this, Quoting the prophet Joel, he says, Then I will pour forth of my spirit, which is what he's talking about happening this day. If you flash forward, um, um, in verse 33, he says, Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. He's saying, Because these men, have been speaking and preaching in other tongues to you. You see and hear these acts of the Holy Spirit because they've been baptized with the Holy Spirit. They've received the tongues of fire. And this is the pouring forth of the Spirit on all mankind. Because up until now, the Holy Spirit only appeared and was used in specific times at specific places to specific people to accomplish specific things. But here he's saying the Holy Spirit is being poured forth on all people. Well, does he mean all people, everybody? Well, in a certain sense, yes, in that Jesus' redemptive work stretches all the way back to the beginning of time and all the way to the end of time to awaken men to the need of salvation. Up until then, we were so dead in our sins that we could not even comprehend the need of the Savior. But you might say, but Brother Sparks, it seems like humankind has always sought um, 
sought out a God figure, that even in places where they did not know of God, they created one, or, or there's glimpses of God. Yeah, that's absolutely true. But the redemptive work of Christ is what makes that possible. It is his prevenient grace, the grace that goes before him, that opens those doors. So yes, the Holy Spirit's been poured forth on all people to partially redeem us, not sufficient for salvation, not sufficient for complete redemption, not even sufficient uh, for justification, but enough that we might awaken to the need of a Savior in our life. And that explains why we have been so much as a people um, seeking, searching, Humans have constantly sought things out, searched, and yet somehow we've missed the greatest so often. Even those of us that are believers miss sometimes the power that is Christ. I will pour forth of my spirit on all mankind. But certainly he's also meaning here, I think, pour forth his spirit on the believers on this group of faith, these people who are called by Christ and anointed by Christ, by the Holy Spirit, to proclaim good news. These people have received the gift of the Holy Spirit. And he says, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And that's very important. Why? Because primarily at those days, while there are really strong examples of matriarchal culture in ancient Near Eastern cultures, um, or in that time period, primarily in the ancient Near East, in this um, area, uh, there was a patrilineal, patriarchal structure. And for him to say, I will pour forth of my Holy Spirit on all mankind and your sons and your daughters, men and women, spoken of here by Peter as co-equals, equally receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit and equally called to prophesy. We need not look any further for the egalitarian nature of the equal nature of the co-equal nature of the call of both men and women to the ministry of Jesus Christ. I have two daughters. I have one son. And the Holy Spirit is poured out on them equally and equally can they respond and equally can they receive the call because here's the thing all of us receive a call we're all called to be laymen others are called out of that the ministry of the laity into something a little deeper and then others are called still further to a deeper commitment and to the order of elders I believe that I believe that there is levels of calling. And it's not where the, where the preacher is up here and the lay people are down here. Actually, biblically, it is inverted. It is the exact opposite. Now, Keith Boyette, in a, in a conference call last night, said that and spoke that in this group, and I thought it was brilliant. I'd heard it before, and I just wanted to repeat it to you tonight. It is opposite of what we think, that the highest order is the call of the laity. Then some are called to go deeper and move further down and further down. And as we go deeper into that calling, the greater the call to just be a servant is. Not some great authority and power, but a servant. All people, sons and daughters. But he doesn't stop there. He says, and your young men shall see visions. You see, in those days, you were a good Jew, you would, before you could be a rabbi, you would apprentice until you were in your 30s. Um, as it was, if you were a, a young Jewish boy, you would, and only a boy, you would be um, at seven required to read and recite sections of the Torah from memory. You would have read and memorized the whole Torah. And you'd be quizzed and then declared ready to move on. At 14, 13, 14, you would be given a choice, um, an option. Um, if you were or at seven, if you were really good, you would be invited to go on. Otherwise, you'd be sent back to your father um, to um, take up the family trade. But if you were really good, you got to, if you're the best of the best, you got to move on. And at 14, you would again be chosen. If you were the best of that best, you were the best of the best of the best, 
then you got to move on and interview with a rabbi. And otherwise, um, otherwise, um, we would, um, you would go back to your father's house and do um, his, um, learn his craft. And if you were the best of the best of the best, you would interview with a rabbi. And if the rabbi uh, chose you, you would then be invited to come and follow him to take up his yoke, which was his teaching of the Torah, to carry his baggage, which was his burden, um, and follow him or eat his dust, literally. Um, walk behind him and learn from him. Then at 30 some odd, you would be fully a man and fully um, an elder and someone that would be sent forth to teach your own interpretation of Torah. Uh, Paul uh, was mentored by Gamaliel, which was one of the greatest scholars of that day, maybe the greatest rabbi of his day, um, rumored to be the Messiah himself, and Gamaliel always uh, deferred and said that it was not, he was not, never claimed to be, uh, and Paul was educated by him um, to be the best of the best. But here he says, your young men will see visions. Young men. Not just your older men that have been through this process, but your young men will see visions. Which he is saying that there is now a direct connection between us and God. We need not necessarily rely on some great teacher or some great wise person. No, the call for those of us that teach is to be servants now. And for you to be empowered by the Holy Spirit, it's not the wisdom of the teacher, but it's the power of the Holy Spirit that matters. Yes, there's great teachers. They have great wisdom. We should and do read things by people we respect. But over and over in the New Testament, when Paul is talking of some people claiming to be of Apollos, some people claiming to be a Paul, and some people claiming to be, oh, I am of somebody else, and I am of Christ, I'm not of any of these... Paul is pretty clear in saying that, you know, I planted, Apollos watered, but it was God who gave the increase. Over and over in the New Testament, it seems very clear um, that the further you raise in leadership and teaching, the further deeper you should go as a servant, unless it is about you. Your young men shall see visions, and your old men dream dreams which tells me that it doesn't matter how old or young you are, you have a place in the kingdom and you have something to offer to the kingdom. You are not worthless. Everyone has value in the kingdom. Everyone has value to add, no matter how old you are or young you are. Sometimes we tend to not um, see the value of our elders as much as we should. Um, we become frustrated with them. We, we do not sit and listen uh, to their wisdom. Now that seems strange. It seems like that's actually diametrically opposed to what I was just saying, but I want you to hear me. They are not, and we are not as leaders, ever to be exalted. It is the spirit that is within us. It is God himself that is the one to be honored. But there is great value in listening to old men that dream dreams. Because old men can dream dreams. Those that have had the experience to see the long breadth and scope of history, at least within their lifetimes, and that have studied history, to look back and say, I have a different kind of dream. We're starting to engage in that conversation around race today in America. It's not going great. There are folks that are way off the mark. Um, I went, listened to a great podcast today. Um, that talked about what matters most is the Imago day that my friend is made in. That it matters not about their skin color or their their looks or their lifestyle or even you know their income. What matters and what gives us value is none of those things. None of our associations, our national identity, none of these things. What matters most is that you and I are human beings made in the image of God. 
I believe that is absolutely right. Maybe it is good to sit and listen to old men. Maybe it's good to listen to our young men have visions. But in 18, he takes it even another step further. Even on my bond slaves, sometimes it says bond servants, both men and women. Again, this echo of the equality of men and women. Even on my bond servants, over and over, he says, I will in those days pour forth of my spirit and they will prophesy. And we see this. We see this then. Young men in the 12, right? Young men that Jesus chose that are now standing forth out there that morning and prophesying, right? And old men. Young men and old men. Side by side. Matthew was no spring chicken, right? And there were others that were even older. And yet there were young men in possibly in their 20s. Peter was no young man. But there was also bond slaves, men and women. Jesus appeared to the er, early on Easter Sunday morning to the women who were telling their stories. There were women in the 750 that were the ones that witnessed the um, ascension. There was women in Jesus' followers that spoke, and Paul even refers to them in his writings as fellow ministers of Christ. And he takes it a step further here. Peter says, Oh, my bond slaves which is quoting from Joel. Even slaves, I will pour out my spirit. So it doesn't matter your economic status, your freedom status. We are all equal in the sight of God in the body of Christ. We are one. Whatever we look like, act like, whoever we are, where we're from, there is one thing that matters that we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And, and we see that in Philemon. At the end of Philemon, Paul says, I'm sending Philemon back to you. Right? I'm sending him back to you because, um, or at the end of Philemon, he's saying, I'm sending your bond slave back to you, your servant back to you, and you should treat him like a brother in Christ because no longer is he just a slave, but he is a brother in Christ. No matter our station. We are equals in the sight of God. A wise man that I met in the Delta once said, and I've heard it said many times before, the ground at the foot of the cross is flat. It means all are welcome to come. And in those days, I will pour forth my spirit and they will prophesy. Then he goes to say, and I will grant wonders in the sky above, which happened on the day of the resurrection. And there will be signs on the earth below, and there were on the day of resurrection. And there were signs done by Jesus before he was uh, crucified. There will be signs that it will be done by the, the apostles, by the disciples, as they went forth. Blood and fire and vapor of smoke. And all of those were attested to on the resurrection day. Or on the on the day of Jesus' death, rather, not resurrection day. And the sun will be turned to darkness, as it was on that Friday, and the moon turned to blood, and before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. And the great and glorious day of the Lord was the resurrection. That was when everything changed. Yes, Jesus had to die on Friday, but what made the greatest difference was the resurrection on Sunday. And she that it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. He, again, in verses 22 and following, makes the argument that Jesus is the Messiah. He is making this to a Jewish audience that need to understand that Jesus fulfilled all of the prophecies of the Messiah. He fit all of the modes. He was the perfect Messiah. As a matter of fact, he was God's Messiah. David, in his prophecies, absolutely lay it out. He was not abandoned to us. To his soul to Hades. He was not allowed to have decay. He said to him, rise up. And he sat down at the right hand of his father. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. In the end, that's the most important thing that we can take from all of this, is that Jesus is Lord. He is the Christ. And he's Lord and Christ. 
Now we could spend months unpacking what that means. Lord and Christ. Christ is Savior. The suffering servant. The Lord means something deeper. Letting him be the Lord of our life. Giving him control and authority and power and responsibility. To give him the ability to speak into our world and, and really order our lives. It's easy to say Jesus is my Savior. It's harder to say he's my Lord. And that's what the whole process of sanctification is all about. It's daily letting Jesus be Lord of more and more of our life. And sometimes it comes quickly, and sometimes it comes slowly, and it comes in jumps and dribs and drabs. Sometimes we slide back. But sometimes we make great leaps. We are at a moment of great testing, I think, in our world. I think we're in one of those seasons of great change, and we have a huge opportunity to take a leap forward or a leap back. And it's our choice. Will we be bearers of the image of God? Will we choose to see in everyone the Imago Dei, the image of God? Will we be peace bearers? Or will we not? Will we be fiercely devoted to truth? Objective truth. Not our truth. Not what we perceive. Not even our opinions. But truth. The facts matter. Jesus died. He was resurrected. He lives. and He lives at the right hand of God the Father. These truths are important. And the truths that you and I have to deal with every day, the facts make a difference. And we live in a body a physical body that is, is going to be resurrected one day because Jesus lived in a physical body that was resurrected. Our physical life here on earth is important. It is not something that we can just you know, slough off. It is important. And how we live here and now is important because it makes a difference on how we witness. It makes a difference on how we make the kingdom come and how we do works of grace and mercy. All those things matter to us. And that's a very Wesleyan way uh, putting it, but it matters. Are we performing acts of grace, acts of mercy? Are we letting the Holy Spirit lead us? Or are we being led by the Spirit of the age? Is it Pentecost? Has Pentecost truly come for you? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I want to invite you to pray with me. If God has moved in your life in such a way over this week, or maybe just tonight, that you're ready to make a greater commitment to Him in your life, to let Him be both Lord and Savior. If you're going to embrace a new, renewed zeal for truth, I want to invite you to pray with me. Father God, I... I pray right now for those that are moved to be at a different place, to move closer to you. If this is their first time, Lord, I, I, I pray that you will help them say to you, Oh, Lord, I'm, I'm a sinner, and I know I am, and there's nothing I can do to my, save myself, and I know that you have sent your Son to die for me. Lord, please fill me with your Holy Spirit. Save me to the uttermost. I accept Jesus as both Lord and Savior of my life. Come fill my heart, Lord. Fill me with your Spirit and baptize me with that self-same Holy Spirit to make me your vessel. Lead me in the paths of righteousness. Transform my heart. Transform me. Sanctify me, O Lord. Lord, give me that second great act of grace. Give me the gift of entire sanctification. Let your perfect love drive out all fear in my life. Today and tomorrow and for the rest of my life. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. If you prayed that prayer with me for the first time and you made your first time commitment to Jesus, let me know that in a private message if you like or you can post a comment. If it's 
something that you're just reaching out to a different level, uh, Facebook message me, text me, um, reach out to me or Sam, and we'll be glad to chat with you. God loves you, and so do I. Don't forget, Sunday morning, 9.30, 10.30, we'll be online. And at 8.30, 9.30, and 10.30, we'll have worship services here. If you've not yet signed up, there's still some space left. Uh, there's a lot of space left in our 8.30 and 9.30 services. And uh, there's some still left at our 10.30 service. So we'd invite you to sign up. We don't want anyone to feel compelled to come if you don't feel safe. And so we're going to invite you to uh, continue to worship at our online campus, our virtual campus, that will now have two worship services at 9.30 and 10.30. And you can make a party of it and watch both of them and, and have Eggs Benedict in between. And then if you, if you rush between 10.30 or at the end of the 10.30 service at 11.30, most of you can probably get to the church by 11.45 and bring me some of that Eggs Benedict if the Holy Spirit moves you to that. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, I hope you have a great Sunday morning with your family worshiping either live or um, live online in our virtual campus. We're just so proud uh, of this church, uh, Maples, during this time, and folks that tune in on, on the night times and tune in with us um, live on Sunday mornings. Um, you're such a blessing to us. You've been a blessing. You continue to be a blessing. I believe that Maples Church's greatest days are yet ahead of us, and I can't wait to see what God is yet to do here. Check back in with us next week. We'll be talking more next week about Vacation Bible School coming up. We're going to do a virtual VBS. There's going to be opportunities for you to sign up to help, uh, to make packets, and also sign up kids. We are not limited in the number of kids we can take because we're not doing it live here. So we are encouraging you to get folks signed up for this week of virtual VBS. We'll have, a, um, we'll have time for you. We'll have singing and storytelling and all these things. It'll be really great. I think you're really going to be blessed by it. Um, Know that God loves you. Have a great evening, and we will see you, uh, oh, 6 o'clock in the morning for Sam's devotion. Don't forget it. My mother said today to me, I love listening to Sam in the morning. He's so good, and he is. Uh, so y'all check Sam out in the mornings. Uh, great guy. Great words. We're so proud to have him on staff. Uh, he has been a blessing to all of us. Um, have a great evening. We'll see you.